Senior Advisor here and the Director of the Project on Nuclear Issues. This is our fourth installment of Pony Debates the Issues, and again, I want to thank Steve Henry from OSD Nuclear Matters, who has been our sponsor for this stream of activities as part of our project on nuclear issues. It's uh, been a great event. It's fed our, uh, our, our blog in which Pony debates the issues during that time. And so it's been, this is the last event until we get into the September, October time frame. It's a little bit later in the summer than I like to do one, but here we are nevertheless. Uh, uh, very timely issue, we're going to talk about North Korea, the proposition being that the United States should continue to pursue the policy of complete and verifiable disarmament of the Korean Peninsula. We have with us two subject matter experts from slightly different ends of the political continuum to debate this issue. Um, one speaking in the affirmative, Bruce Klinger, former CIA, former uh, research fellow, uh, no, now a research fellow uh, for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies, was at Eurasia Group, but had been the chief of the CIA's career branch. Uh, I, too, had a background at the CIA, but that was longer ago than I like to remember. Uh, and Doug Bandau, who has written extensively on this issue, now at the Cato Institute. Uh, I wouldn't say that the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute are on opposite sides of the political continuum, because sometimes they agree as is the want of any libertarian, and sometimes they disagree on this one, but I look forward to an extremely spirited debate. Uh, the first, next person I'd like to introduce is uh, CSIS's own Jessica Yates, who will be moderating this debate. She'll talk, speak quickly to the ground rules. Jessica. As Clark said, the topic is resolved that the United States should continue the policy of complete and verifiable disarmament of the Korean Peninsula. Um, because of the complexities uh, with the North Korea issue, this is a particularly difficult um, topic to codify in a one-sentence resolution, but attempt, uh, essentially what we were trying to capture were two points of departure, the first being sort of the severity of the um, threat, this, the degree to which a nuclear North Korea is unacceptable, and second, the, uh, what the role of the United States should be in de the denuclearization process. Um, the format is slightly modified from the previous events for those that attended the other ones. Uh, there'll be two seven-minute opening remarks, beginning with the affirmative, and then a uh, 12-minute moderator question and answer period in which I'll ask both of them um, one or two questions and then uh, give them uh, the other, the other, their opponent the opportunity to respond, and then two three-minute closing rebuttals. And with that, we're ready. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, to get right into it, I, I might have hoped that the logic of maintaining the U.S. policy of a, a complete and verifiable disarmament or denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula uh, would have been so, so much of a self-evident truth that it was not necessary to debate the issue. Uh, after all, denuclearizing North Korea has been a consistent and bipartisan U.S. policy objective for decades. Uh, despite fierce debates over the best means to achieve that goal, uh, presidential administrations and congresses from both political parties have unswervingly pursued that objective. And having the best and the brightest from both parties in agreement on something, perhaps anything, uh, would seem to be sufficient grounds for justifying the continuation of a policy. However, it has been said that an idea is not responsible for those who believe in it. So let's explore additional justifications. Now, as for debating the topic, Washington is, of course, known as a place for hotly arguing every possible issue, uh, except perhaps how poorly the Nationals baseball team is playing. But to be less facetious, there has been a growing discussion amongst Korea watchers uh, about whether the U.S. should alter its policy, and, and an accompanying rising fear in both South Korea and Japan that the Obama administration will abandon the existing policy. So as such, it makes this topic particularly relevant and timely. Therefore, I, I commend CSIS and the Project on Nuclear Issues for initiating this debate, and I thank them for the opportunity to participate. I'll, I'll lay out a f uh, four main reasons why I think we should maintain the, the current policy. Uh, the first is to uphold and defend the principles of nonproliferation and the rule of law. Principles are important. 
As Edmund Burke said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. To abandon the policy of denuclearization for North Korea would be counter to existing. I haven't, I haven't done seven minutes. <laughs> it's five, you're good. I asked for a few more minutes. Uh, to abandon the policy of denuclearization would be counter to existing UN resolutions, the policies of our allies, and would undermine the credibility of the nonproliferation treaty. It would send a dangerous signal of acquiescence to not only North Korea, but also to Iran and other nuclear aspirants. If we do not implement and defend laws and UN resolutions, they have no value. And if we do not have the courage and the tenacity to uphold agreements, in this case against proliferation, then all UN resolutions become empty promises, precluding international action on any issue, including aggression or genocide. There must be a heavy penalty for provocative actions that transgress the laws. If we aren't willing to uphold the, the principles, why should we expect other nations to abide by or enforce laws? As President Obama said, rules must be binding, violations must be punished, words must mean something. The second reason is to defend the United States. North Korea's growing nuclear and missile capabilities, coupled with Pyongyang's repeated belligerent threat, poses an increasing threat to the United States. It's uncertain how successful North Korea has been in developing weapons, the degree which, uh, to which they've weaponized or miniaturized its fissile material, or how long it'll take to perfect the Taepodong missiles. But Pyongyang's rapid fire provocation since the beginning of the year, and its rejection of both multilateral and bilateral <laughs> negotiations clearly demonstrate that the regime is determined to develop a viable nuclear weapon and the means to deliver it via ICBM. We know North Korea has already twice tested a nuclear device and claims to have weaponized all of its plutonium. As for its long-range missile delivery capability, the April 5th Taepodong-2 launch, though depicted as a failure, successfully more than doubled the previous range of its missile threat. A national intelligence estimate by the U.S. intelligence community in 2001 assessed that a three-stage Taepodong-2, when fully developed, would have the range to deliver a nuclear warhead to all of the continental United States. Washington should continue to develop and deploy missile defense systems to defend itself against North Korea's continuing quest to develop the capability to threaten the U.S. with a nuclear warhead. But even as we take prudent means to defend against a threat, we should also continue efforts to eliminate the threat. A preemptive military attack or forcible regi regime change would be provocative, escalatory, and unpredictably dangerous. As such, continuing a denuclearization policy to remove the nuclear sword from the dictator's hand through an integrated approach of sanctions and diplomacy provides a more pragmatic and viable approach. Three, protecting our allies by strengthening peace and stability in Asia. North Korea's increasing nuclear and missile capabilities clearly threaten our allies, South Korea and Japan. Pyongyang has already deployed 600 Scud missiles and uh, 250 Nodong missiles that can uh, range all of South Korea and Japan. A lesson of history is that we cannot decouple ourselves from overseas threats to our allies and those that share our values. In 1999, former Secretary of Defense William Perry concluded, acquisition by the DPRK of nuclear weapons or long-range missiles, and especially the combination of the two, could undermine the relative stability in East Asia. Such weapons in the hands of the DPRK might weaken deterrence as well as increase the damage if deterrence failed. It could also spark an arms race in the region and would surely do grave damage to the global nonproliferation regimes covering nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. A U.S. retreat from attempts to denuclearize North Korea would not only leave our allies more vulnerable to the direct military danger, but also to North Korean coercion. There would be an even more acute threat if we were to couple it with a withdrawal of U.S. troops from Asia because we either deem the denuclearization objective too difficult to achieve or the neighborhood to be too dangerous. Isolationism isn't a viable policy. Pulling up the drawbridge and hiding behind the cloistered moat of the world's oceans didn't work in 1939, and designating the Korean Peninsula as laying beyond America's Asian defense perimeter didn't work in 1950. Moreover, cutting and running or saying, sorry boys, you're on your own, is not an American tradition. After all, the symbol of, the, of America is the eagle, not the ostrich. To shirk from a challenge would be too much like the reported words of one general on the eve of battle telling his troops, men, I want you to fight vigorously and then run. And as I'm a bit lame, I'm going to start running now. The fourth reason is don't preemptively accept defeat. 
Abandoning the policy of denuclearizing North Korea would affirm the pattern of not punishing North Korea for its belligerence and transgressions. It simply encourages worse behavior. As the Perry Report again concluded, a policy of trading material compensation for security would only encourage the DPRK to further blackmail and would encourage proliferators worldwide to engage in similar blackmail. It would also set the precedent for the U.S. to provide concessions on other important issues with North Korea or Iran. If we cave on this, why should we think we believed we'd be believed if we said we'll be tough on the, the next important issue, such as verification? Some might advocate focusing only on preventing proliferation since achieving denuclearization is deemed to be unattainable. But abandoning denuclearization is like saying it's just too hard to enforce the law, so let's accept and condone transgressions and violations. Similar to saying we just can't win in the war on drugs, so let's admit defeat and legalize all illegal drugs. Moreover, trying to merely maintain the status quo of keeping the nuclear genie in a Korean, in a Korean Peninsula bottle is unsustainable in the long run. North Korea has privately threatened to proliferate plutonium or nuclear weapon technology. Containment, rather than eliminating the threat directly, is also a less effective strategy, similar to chasing cockroaches with a hammer. North Korea already proliferated nuclear technology to Syria. We know that in late 2008 it attempted to uh, proliferate something in violation of UN Resolution 1718. The U.S. invoked the PSI in order to get India to prevent a flight from a North Korean flight from Burma to Iran. And the feckless chase of the North Korean ship Kangnam also showed the inherent constraints in trying to prevent North Korean proliferation rather than removing its source. Now, in conclusion, I focus my remarks on the denuclearization or the disarmament aspect of the debate title. In the interest of time, I've not covered the complete and verifiable component, uh, but it's some, i.e., the need for effective verification. Uh, we could discuss that during question and answer, as well as discussing recommendations for achieving North Korean denuclearization. I'm aware that achieving North Korean denuclearization will not be easy, and there are no guaranteed successes for any policy recommendations. In fact, we may be trying to negotiate the non-negotiable and achieve the unachievable. There may be simply no set of inducements and penalties that ensures North Korea abandons its nuclear weapons. As such, it would be prudent even now for Washington to be discussing contingency plans, particularly with South Korea and Japan, should negotiations no longer seem to be a viable policy option. But this difficulty should not deter us from continuing to try. As Teddy Roosevelt said, in a moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The worst thing is to do nothing. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And indeed, Cato and Heritage occasionally agree. Many years ago, I was a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. So I've had my contacts with the Heritage Foundation over the years. The issue of North Korea is one that most uh, policymakers, I think, would prefer not to have to deal with. Certainly, the Obama administration did not expect this to be on its plate nearly so early. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we live in a world in which we can't make those choices very easily. I think everyone in this audience understands why North Korea is a problem. It's an ugly, unique mix of a murderous regime that's willing to allow hundreds of thousands, if not more, of its own <coughs> citizens to uh, starve to death. It's a regime that currently is in the midst of potentially unstable leadership transition. Uh, the uh, dear leader obviously is not doing well. He suffered a stroke, and there are reports now that he has pancreatic cancer and apparently is trying to uh, pass the regime on to his 27-year-old son. I think a dubious prospect uh, given the current circumstances. It's also a regime that's engaged in uh, external provocation. We've had both a nuclear test recently as well as multiple missile tests denunciation of the six-party talks, the armistice accord, and tearing up the investment agreement with South Korea. <clears throat> and you mix that, uh, you know, that all together, we clearly have a rather nasty mix. There are no good answers here, and I think this is the crux of the debate, is that uh, in a diplomacy, everyone would like to see it work. It's still worth pursuing, but we have to recognize the difficulties that we face. Every step the DPRK takes backwards makes a diplomatic solution less likely. Every new threat, every new test suggests that the regime is more interested in buying time as opposed to coming to an agreement. The ultimate solution then looks further and further away. Sanctions are a great hope. Nevertheless, they only have so far had limited effect on a regime that's willing to allow mass starvation of its people. And they're not likely to be terribly effective without the acquiescence, uh, particularly of China. 
Russia as well, but China is clearly the most important player here, accounting for an estimated 75% of trade with North Korea and the provider of aid and uh, food aid and energy. <coughs> you know, the <coughs> ultimate impact of sanctions, even if enforced, are somewhat uncertain, but unless we get them enforced, they're not likely to bring us to a successful resolution. And the military option is a very bad one. I think it's hard to imagine a military ex exercise of military force that wouldn't trigger war. My guess is the regime in the North would view it as being the first step in regime change and would find it utterly unacceptable to stand by, and it could wreak havoc. The North, of course, would lose any conflict, but the consequences, particularly for South Korea, but also for American military forces and the North Koreans, would be horrific. So the question is what to do. Now, we all know the perfect. We'd all love to have regime change, and we all would love to have denuclearization. There's no doubt about that. We share the same ends. It's a wonderful goal. The world would be a better place not to mention North Korea. And that's led to multiple assertions on the part of U.S. officials and others saying that we cannot accept a nuclear North Korea. The risk, I would argue, is that we may let the perfect become the enemy of the good. That clearly the regime is going to resist any kind of regime change. And from their standpoint, especially these days given the internal changes and perhaps rising role of the military within the system, denuclearization may very well be viewed as almost the same thing as regime change. I'm afraid that the likelihood of winning denuclearization with the current regime, that is not only stopping further nuclear developments, but getting North Korea to give up whatever weapons it has developed, are vanishing. <clears throat> the benefits from, to the North are very clear, possessing even a small nuclear force. Defense, it can ensure that it is not attacked, does not become like Serbia or Iraq. It uh, gives it status, otherwise who would pay attention to a small starving nation? And blackmail, trying to raise money and uh, <clears throat> get, uh, you know, get various benefits from the West. And I would argue that the, the behavior of the North certainly would seem to s suggest uh, this is a, a red line in their behavior, a willingness to dismantle an old reactor, but uh, balking at uh, intrusive verification procedures in terms of its past nuclear behavior. I think there is a hope for a negotiated settlement with the North. It's much more likely to be one of freezing the arsenal and preventing uh, proliferation to stopping any further nuclear developments. Not a good option, notably. Very unpleasant, but perhaps livable compared to the alternative. I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the good news, if there is good news about North Korea, is that Kim Jong-il is not suicidal. Kim Jong-il wants his virgins in this world, not the next. This is not a regime that's going to loose missiles against the United States. If deterrence can work against Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, I suspect it can work against Kim Jong-il or whatever follows him in the tragic capital of Pyongyang. Far more dangerous is a North Korea with a growing arsenal, with more and bigger missiles, and with the prospect of proliferation. It opened a Pandora's box in East Asia <coughs> in terms of potential proliferation elsewhere, and would certainly raise the threat level and the instability in the region. So it strikes me that we may very well want as a formal goal denuclearization because that would be what we prefer. Nevertheless, in practice, what are, we might be better aiming for is to try to freeze developments with verification, eliminate an on, any ongoing nuclear program, and accept the fact that North Korea is likely to remain a nuclear state with a relatively small nuclear arsenal. Not only is it a question of negotiating with uh, <clears throat> North Korea, but it's also a question of involving China. The regional powers have much more at stake than the United States here and they should be taking a much broader role. They are the ones most threatened by proliferation. They're most threatened by missile developments. They are most threatened by the prospect of instability and war. China today, I suspect, sees the issue as one that provides it indeed with certain benefits. The United States must come hat in hand to China and ask Beijing for help in dealing with North Korea. It sees this as an American issue and uh, you know, has many concerns in terms of a collapse of North Korea, the question of a united Korea allied with the United States, many other things. If we hope to get serious Chinese cooperation in terms of diplomacy, sanctions, shutting down perhaps North Korean and Iranian air traffic, and even conceivably covert action, we're going to have to have goals that are compatible with those with Beijing, which Beijing is willing to support. Engaging Beijing in this way is going to be very difficult. Nevertheless, I think there is a possibility, among other things, pointing out to Beijing that the natural progression of events could very well be a North Korea with a growing nuclear arsenal, followed conceivably by South Korea and Japan, because the U.S. could say <clears throat> rather loudly, we're not sure we want to stay in the middle of that if you're not willing to help out with the North Koreans. Who knows, maybe we wouldn't stand in the way of the South Koreans and Japanese, in which case the nightmare would be shared, so maybe Beijing should do a little bit more to help. 
The U.S., I think, could encourage that by indicating it would not uh, take geopolitical advantage of any transformation of the Korean Peninsula. The American troops would come home. They would not remain in a unified Korea. And the U.S. would help <clears throat> in terms of any economic problems with refugees and uh, economic chaos. At the end of the day, what we want is the, <clears throat> the parties in the region to do more, and we also want the most realistic solution. Now, obviously, this may be a dead end. Perhaps the PRC won't be willing to help. Nevertheless, there is no good answer here. Again, my reaction is we're facing a world of what is, what is possible as opposed to what is best. You know, denuclearization is an obvious objective. If we are able to achieve a freeze, perhaps, especially if there's change within the regime in coming years, we could achieve full denuclearization at a future point. But we don't want to let the perfect become the enemy of the good. It strikes me the path to denuclearization, certainly without Chinese support, appears to be blocked. War would be a cure worse than the disease. We have to look for other alternatives, and I think that probably means you know, accepting a lesser goal, even though the ultimate objective of denuclearization is the best one. Thank you. Um, Bruce, in your opening statements, you listed a lot of reasons that the United States should want a nuclear-free uh, peninsula. You also identified a lot of reasons that it, admitting failure, admitting failure, is bad. Um, but you didn't list any reasons why we haven't, in fact, failed. And in a national security environment in which there's a widening gap between requirements and the capacity to meet them, there is actually a consequence to fruitless effort. So what, I mean, give us hope or, or what exact measures can the United States take to denuclearize North Korea? I, I think the most uh, effective manner is a, is a three-part strategy. One is uh, to strengthen defensive measures. Uh, and that includes not only uh, because, as we've seen, negotiations and international pressure have not prevented North Korea from pursuing nuclear tests and long-range missile range. So the first step is, to, is defensive measures, which includes not only missile defense, but strengthening uh, non-proliferation efforts, uh, reassuring our allies, et cetera. Uh, the second is to implement punitive measures, uh, which not only upholds the, the uh, principles and, and non-proliferation treaty and international law, et cetera, uh, but also uh, tries to bring North Korea back to the table. And the punitive measures are three levels. One is what we can get through the UN Security Council. Second is a parallel effort led, a multilateral effort led by the United States using uh, existing international and U.S. law and calling upon other nations to apply their laws, uh, targeting not only North Korea but the other end of the proliferation pipeline. Uh, as well as those uh, that are complicit in North Korea's illegal activities. And then three, a sub rosa effort as uh, was under, uh, underway during the Banco Delta Asia issue, which is quiet uh, <laughs> negotiations or meetings between the U.S. government and Chinese banks, companies, and others uh, as well. Uh, and then third is negotiation. Sanctions like engagement is not an ends in itself, but is a means to achieve an ends. And what we're trying to do is squeeze North Korea with one hand while holding open the door of negotiations with the other. So we are trying to constrain their behavior. We're trying to moderate their behavior. We're trying to change their behavior uh, to come back to the nego uh, negotiating table uh, and laying out not only the, the downside to their violations and aberrant behavior, but also the benefits that they could enjoy if uh, they rejoin or, or begin to implement their commitments. What gives meaning to those to the laws if the people advocating them think that forcible regime change would be extremely dangerous? I, I didn't ask. I didn't advocate forcible regime change. What else gives change. meaning to the laws? Enforcing them. Uh, what we've seen so far is uh, the UN uh, has uh, targeted three North Korean companies. Uh, the U.S. has targeted two. Apparently today there was going to be perhaps an expansion of that list. Uh, in meeting with U.S. officials, we've also seen uh, that there will be a resumption of the multifaceted effort that was uh, done in 2005, which was very effective uh, in that trying to cut off the regime from its funding. So it's, it's several levels, what's public and also what's private. So uh, by constraining North Korea's uh, finances, trying to moderate their behavior, uh, that's not bringing about a regime change. Um, well, two questions. The first is, 
what ex they're pretty insulated from international pressure, economic pressure. What other strings can we pull that you think would be meaningful? Uh, the second question is, if this is a regime that responds to diplomatic pressure, uh, it seems to that seems to be based on the assumption that it calculates perceived gains versus perceived loss. Uh, why wouldn't that same rationality moderate North Korea as a nuclear weapon state? They are largely insulated from the international financial network, but they are still connected. And that is why in 2005 the, uh, the multifaceted effort was effective. As a uh, senior uh, Obama administration official recently said, uh, they, they recognize that the Banco Delta Asia effort, and that's, as I said, not just the 22 million that they, they froze, but it was all of the Sub Rosa effect as well. Uh, was very effective, and it was a mistake for the Bush administration to have fallen off of that policy, and that's from the, the current uh, administration. So obviously, as Mr. Bandau said, we had to, we have to get China on board, and we may be more able to get China to do uh, quiet efforts uh, constraining uh, financial interaction between North Korea and the outside world, uh, as well as restricting food and fuel, but quietly as opposed to expecting them to publicly announce uh, formal declaration or formal uh, sanctions against North Korea. My second question was about the, um, their rationality, if they can respond to pressure. Well, we've, it, people have said that uh, you know, sanctions don't work, but we have seen in the world that it has. Sanctions in conjunction with diplomacy work to, to get Libya to abandon its uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, we've also uh, you know, seen that uh, you know, some have said China or North Korea does nothing when it's pressured. Well. The corollary is they usually do also do nothing unless they're pressured. Right. So it's a conjunction of pressure and uh, maintaining the door open for negotiations. I, I guess my question was why doesn't that logic moderate the regime as a nuclear weapon state? Why wouldn't that make their nuclearization less unacceptable? Well, I think North Korea's uh, having a nuclear North Korea, given its past actions and pa given its current belligerent threats against the United States, against South Korea, against Japan, makes a nuclear North Korea inherently uh, destabilizing for Northeast Asia. So I think rather than simply capping uh, and admitting that we no longer have denuclearization as an end goal, simply trying to cap the problem I don't think is sufficient. I think we have to try to eliminate the threat not only to our allies, but the long-range threat or the long-term threat to the United States. <laughs> I think Bruce is right in terms of a two-pronged strategy. I think that, in essence, one has to offer both a vision of a positive future if they engage the international community and are willing to step back from their current course, as well as punitive options to limit them, constrain them, and particularly to try to dry up their funding to the extent that we can. I think the Banco Delta in Asia the example, the bank shows if China is involved, there can be an enormous impact on North Korean behavior. I think the challenge is, Number one, there has to be an obvious set of positives. Chinese have made this very clear, that if we want their cooperation, they have to perceive there's something beneficial being offered. And it may be worth rethinking, rather than a tit for tat, you know, this kind of process to essentially lay out for North Korea, here's everything you can get, but it requires serious, you know, change and verification, and this is what we want for it, as opposed to kind of giving, dribbling a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, I think the challenge is, again, I'm not terribly hopeful. You know, the problem is we see several years of negotiating pattern. I think there's an increasing feeling that the North is primarily interested in stringing things out so it can become a nuclear power weapon state. Uh, that's not for certain, of course. I think we have to test them, and that requires continuing negotiations. But I think what complicates it is the current leadership problem in Pyongyang, that uh, where we have a very much a physically weakened Kim Jong-il, potentially uh, with a deadly disease. I mean, the five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is 5%. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, these are simply reports unconfirmed. Nevertheless, there's a lot of fear that the military has taken a more important role. The National Defense Commission seems to have taken over certain powers. You know, he's appointed his brother-in-law to the commission. In fact, Kim Jong-un, you know, his youngest son who's supposed to take over, is also has a mid-level position there. So the question is, if you have a leadership, if not in crisis, at least in potential transition with enhanced military role, I am not uh, at all confident that diplomacy is going to get us there. I think it will require substantially more pressure. Only the Chinese, I think, can apply that. I'd like to have the U.S. apply more to the extent we can, but China is the critical one here. Unless we can enlist them, I think we're going to have trouble making this approach have much chance of success. Um, I want to ask about your comment that the 
United States should cede responsibility for the process to regional players. Uh, U.S. assurances to South Korea and Japan provide their existential security. So part of, I mean, it's a large, significant reason that we have such a stake in, in the conflict. If we start transferring responsibility to those regional players, what does it say about those commitments or what should happen to those commitments? Well, it strikes me that, uh, you know, security commitments should reflect security environment. Uh, you know, South Korea in 1953 is a very different South Korea than today. It's not at all clear to me why, <laughs> at least on conventional terms, a South Korea with 30 to 40 times the GDP of the North, twice the population, a vast technological lead, as well as a relationship with China that suggests China would not be involved in any war if the North Koreans attack, why South Korea should not, in fact, take over responsibility for its defense. I think you know, the world in 1953 and 63 and even 73 looked very different than the world today. I'd make the same argument for Japan. I understand regional concerns over Japan taking on a larger role. But it strikes me that in a world in which we have a $2 trillion deficit this year, we face $10 trillion worth of deficits over the next decade, it's very hard to explain why the U.S. should be in a position of defending countries, certainly on a conventional scale, that can defend themselves. So that, I think, is in a sense separate from this current debate is something that we should be proceeding upon over a longer term. It's not a thing to do immediately, but it's certainly something that I would argue is in America's interest. It is far better for the United States to have powerful allies in the region who are the first responders if there's a, a crisis in the region, rather than expecting Washington to be the final guarantor of Seoul, Taipei, Tokyo, who, you know, Sydney, whoever else. If Japan took responsibility for its own defense, it would have nuclear weapons within probably under a year, South Korea, a few more months. Uh, what would the region look like? What would North Korean capabilities look like in five years? Well, I think it's not clear that there's an imminent threat of either of those countries going nuclear. I think, in fact, I would use that very much as the negotiating posture with China. And China needs to understand that, in fact, the nightmare is likely to be shared. China could not expect a, a growing nuclear arsenal in North Korea without this spreading. And if China does not want nuclear weapons in Japan, that China needs to do much more in terms of resolving this crisis. Currently, China has the best of all worlds. China can use this for its own advantage, gain influence in Washington, have a buffer state, <laughs> you know, and have the U.S. restrain American friends in the region who could build countervailing weapons. I think that there's a long-term issue that it may not, uh, you know, we're, someday we may have to deal with anyway. Will Tokyo forever believe that Washington is prepared to sacrifice Washington for Tokyo? I'm not sure. It depends a lot on how the region grows. It depends on growth and changes within China itself. At the very least, both the uh, Tokyo and uh, South Korea could do much more in conventional terms, even if we wanted to maintain a nuclear guarantee, and that would be the last thing that I would pull off. I think that that nuclear guarantee could stay even as they have conventional superiority in their own borders. I would argue American forces in South Korea are essentially nuclear hostages. North Korea has very little ability to hit the United States other than American forces on the South Korean Peninsula. They aren't needed for the convention of the force of South, defense of South Korea. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't come home. Your comment about uh, withdrawing the commitment to Japan, scaring China into pressuring, you know, increasing pressure on North Korea does not change the fact that Japan would still develop a nuclear weapon. That just eliminates one of the demand side factors being North Korea, but they're still threatened by China. I, I, and even if those, those you know, commitments were not formally withdrawn, but you know, they started laying the groundwork for withdrawing them, and, and inevitably Japan would most likely be preparing at least covertly a nuclear weapons program. I really want to know what the region would look like if both of those countries, particularly if Japan, had nuclear weapons. And, or, if, or just say if you knew that that premise was true, that Japan would have nuclear weapons, would you still advocate transferring responsibility to, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Well, without question, I'd transfer conventional responsibility. As I indicated, you can separate the two. You can, you can maintain a nuclear umbrella over countries, but say on conventional terms, you know, you need to have the forces to defend yourself. It's inexcusable for South Korea not to have the conventional arms to defend itself. It's easily capable of doing so. There's no reason why the U.S. should be expected to provide that. The U.S. has other things on its mind. I think over the longer term, the U.S. has to make some very clear <clears throat> decisions about how <laughs> involved it wants to be in the middle of potential nuclear disputes, especially depending on how the region goes. You know, at the end of the day, are we more or less secure if we you know, promise to get involved in a nuclear war between China and fill in the blank? Well, you know, deterrent, you know, commitments like that have three impacts, one of which is deterrence. You hope the Chinese would never be foolish enough to test it. On the other hand, it has to be believed, and the Chinese have already indicated, at least when it comes to Taipei, they're not so convinced that we'd be prepared to take that risk. 
But if you have a, a commitment like that, it does it, you know, if deterrence fails, it means you are involved. And then suddenly you are in a horrible situation of contemplating a nuclear exchange with China or Japan. And the third is it tends to change the behavior of your allies. We've certainly seen that with Taiwan under President Chen Shui-bian, who engaged in much more provocative behavior. I mean, DPP officials were very explicit, saying, we believe you'll defend us. We don't believe any of this silliness about that if we're irresponsible, you know, you wouldn't want to do so. We think you're committed to us, so we can do what we want and push for independence. I would argue that played a role in the war between Georgia and Russia. The Georgian president believed he could be backed up by the United States, so you, you play more provocative behavior. You believe you have the hegemon behind you. So the United States has to make some long-term decisions. Are we prepared forever to have those kinds of guarantees? Again, I think that's a debate we have to have that's very serious. I think that we can make the threat to the Chinese and we don't have to follow through on it if we choose not to. But if we want to move the debate forward and get China energized, they need to have a prospect that they share the nightmare along with us. Right now, I think the perception in Beijing is they don't share the nightmare. As long as they don't think they share the nightmare, we're not going to get the kind of cooperation that we desperately need to have effective sanctions. But as long as we have that nuclear guarantee, it's our nightmare. We have territory on the border. How can we withdraw? How can we separate it conventionally in, in the nuclear and conventional element when we will, we will trade Washington no. for No, I would, I would argue that you know, if you want to have a nuclear guarantee, what you simply sit, you use it against another country saying they better not use nuclear weapons. But on conventional terms, I would argue that South Korea clearly is capable of defending itself. And we should expect allies to do so. The argument South Korea can't defend itself on conventional terms is a bit like the U.S. begging its NATO allies to protect it from Mexico. I mean, you know, South Korea has had plenty of time, and it clearly has the capabilities to do a lot more. Same thing with Japan, recognizing other countries in the region prefer that not as an option. Nevertheless, from an American standpoint, far better to have well-armed, effective allies to defend themselves as opposed to have underperforming allies dependent upon the United States for defense in a region that could very well be rather unstable and dangerous. But our incentive to denuclearize North Korea is certainly tied to our nuclear assurance to South Korea. We have a policy of nonproliferation that goes well beyond that. There's very good reason for us not to want nukes in North Korea for proliferation purposes. And even if we didn't have troops in the region, we don't want an unstable East Asia. We much prefer a stable, prosperous, peaceful East Asia. So we, we don't want nukes in North Korea for very good reasons, and there are many of them. Okay. The, I guess that would be uh, my last question. How ought the United States curb nuclear proliferation in a world where we're withdrawing extended deterrence and we can't enforce Non, the non-proliferation regime, or, or if we shouldn't, if we should just let the floodgates down, what should the United States do now with respect to its you know, central deterrent to prepare for that world? Well, I think what we, well, missile defense makes a lot of sense. It's very good to have some defense against incoming missiles. We certainly want to maintain a sophisticated nuclear deterrent that can protect us against large states like Russia or you know, eventually China as well as smaller powers. I think the non-proliferation has to be pursued in, in certain ways on an ad hoc basis. We were not going to stop India and Pakistan from getting nuclear weapons. We applied sanctions that had no impact other than get them both angry at us. You know, the, the, were we going to bomb them? The answer is no. You know, the uh, Bush administration made a decision at the nuclear agreement with India. It was denounced in the non-proliferation community. Probably made geopolitical sense. We made an accommodation. We've never worried very much about the French and the British having nuclear weapons. We worry an awful lot more for very good reasons about the Iranians and the North Koreans. I think we take a, set, a process by or a, an example-by-example example, uh, you know, process where we try to use anything that we can, whether it be diplomacy, sanctions, pressure, coordination with allies, and then we have to make decisions on if it's going to fail. Are we prepared to use military force? If not, are we prepared to live with it? Does that mean extended deterrence from the United States? Does that mean allowing an ally to move forward on their own program? I think that's something where it's hard to have a general rule. I wish nonproliferation, I think, is a good thing, even though it's a bit hypocritical. You know, the, the major powers have tasted sin and don't want anybody else to have the the same problem. Nevertheless, I think in the world we have today, it's very hard to imagine how we can enforce uniform nonproliferation. We're going to have to make judgments. I think we should try to stop it. We have to be realistic in terms of some places we're not going to be able to. Do you have a response? Uh, I, I would say I, a couple points is, you know, the idea that deterrence worked against the Soviet Union and, and China but that a bigger danger is North Korea's growing arsenal. To me, that would seem to be internally consistent, inconsistent. If, if it was, you know, okay to rely on a, a balance of terror with Soviet Union and China, it would seem that a growing North Korean nuclear arsenal wouldn't be a problem. I, I disagree. I think we need to not only cap it, but try to eliminate it. Um, I agree that China is critical, and, and 
if it's possible to have a come to Jesus meeting with an atheistic leadership, I think we ought to have it. Um, <laughs> but I think in doing so, I would not uh, advocate, you know, threatening to unleash uh, South Korea and Japan, you know, uh, nuclear programs or calling upon China to engage in covert action uh, to overthrow the regime in North Korea. I think it'd be better uh, to point out to China that, you know, their current softball approach to North Korea has not worked. Uh, you know, sort of a Dr. Phil moment of how did that work out for you? Uh, you know, soft peddling the response in April to the missile launch, the, uh, you know, so fearful of creating instability that they're unwilling to do anything against North Korea uh, has only encouraged North Korea to do more. So I think we have to uh, make clear to China that North Korea's antics uh, are largely a result or partly a result of China allowing them or giving them a green light uh, and covering their backs so that uh, North Korea never really had to worry about anything. So I think we have to point out uh, to, North, uh, to China that North Korea's continuing behavior could uh, you know, continue to escalate problems. We're on a bit of a runaway train right now with uh, the U.S. and North Korea, you know, uh, engaging in, uh, you know, sort of one-upsmanship in, in belligerence. Uh, you know, I think for the U.S. it's, it's clearly a, a proper response to respond to violations. But uh, I think we do have to try to convince China that its current policy is not uh, maintaining the stability in, in the region. We're going to open it up to audience um, Q&A. Uh, do you want us to go back and forth? Or was that? Uh, you know, that's because ask you and, oh, okay. then, and then so now audience questions and you both respond to those. Okay. And, unless, uh, no, you that's have, fine. Okay. Bill Taylor. We agree that whatever we do, we're going to have to have China's cooperation with us. What is it that China wants from us that we can give them to achieve our goals that, uh, Bruce, that you're advocating? I don't think it's so much a, you know, a, either a negotiation with China or a, you know, we'll offer you this if you, you know, act responsibly in, on North Korea. I don't think we, you know, trade Taiwan for North Korea or, you know, kind of, I don't think we, you know, offer a trade deal in response. I think we have to make clear, though, uh, that if, you know, they want to be seen as a responsible stakeholder. Uh, they can't be that by being an obstructionist at the UN uh, and undermining international efforts uh, to maintain uh, international law, the UN resolutions, and non-proliferation treaty. So, uh, and also point out to them that if they value stability uh, so much, that North Korea's current behavior is undermining that uh, strategic key street strategic objective of China. So rather than offering them something to buy them, uh, to buy their uh, acting responsibly, I think it's more a case of uh, pointing out uh, you know, the benefits of trying to rein in North Korea uh, and also the, the severe costs of if North Korea continues down its current path. I think it's not so much paying them for the behavior, but make, convincing them they would not come out at a disadvantage, convincing them that it is worth the risk and the price of doing more, <laughs> and convincing them the status quo is worse. I mean, I think that requires, number one, the assurance on refugees and economic collapse in the north. They're not interested in having 10 million refugees show up across the border. They have enough problems with ethnic uh, issues these days. You know, even though it's a re you know, growing economy, nevertheless, it's a relatively poor country. I think that could require assurances from the U.S. and South Korea, certainly, potentially Japan, which, you know, a number of ethnic Koreans went there in the 60s. The families are still there, you know, that to share in the cost, for example. I think geopolitical disadvantage in terms of American troop placement, a, a reunited Korea also uh, worries them. They, the current situation is advantageous. They have an ally on their border. They have a buffer. And you know, it gives them a certain amount of clout to negotiating position. I think they need to be convinced that this isn't going there. They will not be at a material geopolitical disadvantage. Some Chinese don't particularly worry about American troops on their border because they recognize that we can overcome distance. Others still do. But I think that's, a, again, an assurance to that effect. It's not buying them off, but it's simply saying, if you are a good citizen, and we all want people to be good citizens, but typically people respond to other incentives more, uh, more effectively, if you act that way, then you're not going to be at a disadvantage because of this. I think making the argument, which is an important one, of recognizing their leadership, if you want to convince the world, you want to convince East Asia of a peaceful rise, there's no better way to do so 
than to help us solve this problem of North Korea, which is both a humanitarian catastrophe as well as a geopolitically unstable situation. That is a very good way to convince the world and your neighbors that, in fact, you're a responsible player. I also think we need to convince them that the current situation is not to their advantage. The current situation could have an implosion. We don't know what's going to happen if there's factional infighting. We don't know what's going to happen in the North. They could be stuck with this burden anyway. I also think that's the advantage of saying don't assume that. Proliferation stops in Pyongyang if you don't do anything to stop it there. We don't know where it might end up, and you're probably not going to be happy if that's the case. So I think one has to give a, a larger package of convincing them. They won't respond to dicta. It's going to have to be convincing them that it's in their interest, not just as good citizens, but as geopolitical players, to uh, take the action we want. Um, I actually have two questions. So far, the conversation has been focused too much on the security of the states and also how the states should defend its allies. But um, according to a documentary on, New on North Korea done by a, a Hong Kong media company, the reason why North Korea regards the United States as an enemy is the belief that the United States is responsible for the division on the, uh, on the Korean peninsula um, in other words, it's the United States that caused the separation of South Korea from North Korea. So therefore, my question is, should we give more importance to South-North relations and U.S. involvement in, in relation to U.S. security and international security? And my second question is about the concept of non-proliferation. I think for a country that does not have nuclear weapon, the fact that Korea, no, Korea, Russia, China, and America have nuclear weapons, while the other countries are not allowed to have nuclear weapons. Actually, it's, it's simply unjustifiable. I wonder, in this context, how should we provide incentive for these countries not to nuclear, nuclearize themselves? Thank you. Um, I know North Korea may blame the U.S. for the division of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea tried to rectify that. Um, by invading South Korea at uh, great loss of life, and I don't think anyone, at least in the South, appreciated that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, and, and as for whether the U.S. should encourage greater, you know, North-South dialogue, I mean, you know, that is an issue for the Koreas uh, to be uh, engaged in. Uh, the present government in Seoul has reached out to North Korea. They've said that uh, they will not only continue engagement, they will uh, significantly raise their living standards if uh, North Korea simply abides by the documents that they've already signed. Um, you know, the U.S. doesn't stand in the way of North-South dialogue. Uh, we're in favor of it. The U.S. is in favor of eventual reunification. Uh, that's a matter for the, the Koreans to work out amongst themselves. Um, you know, uh, North Korea has rejected not only multilateral nego nuclear negotiations, they've rejected repeated attempts by the Obama administration to initiate bilateral dialogue, and they've rejected uh, repeated attempts by the South Korean government to engage in bilateral dialogue. So uh, North-South dialogue is, is not going well, but it's because uh, of North Korea's uh, fault. Um, as for nonproliferation, you know, the nonproliferation treaty uh, calls for the eventual you know, disarmament of all nations. Uh, you know, I think that's a, a you know, very long-term goal. I think, uh, you know, as long as there are other nations, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a very long time before the U.S. and, and Russia and China give up theirs. Uh, but obviously that's the effort behind the, the SALT treaties, the START treaties, and then President Obama's recent Prague speech. So, you know, again, it's a long-term goal. But uh, I think you also have to take into account not just possession, but sort of the nature of the country with it. Uh, I think everyone is more concerned about a Soviet Union or a communist China or a North Korea or Iran with nuclear weapons uh, than a democracy, so, you know, democracy such as Great Britain and, uh, and France. I mean, to blame the United States for the division of Korea would seem to leave out the Soviet Union, which was rather relevant at that time. And, of course, the division of Korea meant that, you know, 48 million South Koreans today live in freedom as opposed to the horror up north. So I don't think the U.S. has much to apologize for in terms of the division of the peninsula. You know, the U.S. has been blamed by South Korean students as well. And my reaction was, I mean, there's a lot of complaint one can make about the uh, occupation process, but we're really missing the fundamental point. If you look at the two Koreas today, those students would not be alive protesting if they were in the north. If they lived in a society where they could protest, that would suggest there is some benefit, at least of that division. 
<clears throat> you know, north-south relations should be a matter for the Koreas. The U.S. should indicate it would no, is, has no plans to stand in the way of any <laughs> negotiations, reunification, federation, co-federation, whatever countries you'll want to come up with. That clearly is something for the Koreas. The U.S. wishes the Koreans well, just as it wished the Germans well. This is something for them as opposed to the U.S. or outside powers to determine. Um, you know, the question of nonproliferation, <clears throat> I mean, again, I mean, the problem is it's an utterly hypocritical policy, but one that strikes me as being very valuable which is a world of fewer nuclear weapons in general, I think is a better, more stable world, so we'd prefer not to have them spread, even though any country out there can say, why you and not us? Then it's a question of trying to create an incentive structure, working with other countries, finding other benefits, making the case why you know, expansion of nuclear weapons is not in the interest of those countries, a number of things. Again, I don't think there's one answer. I think it requires a fairly sophisticated policy, and it's gonna, we have to accept the fact we won't be successful everywhere, but it's certainly worth the effort. I just realized that after all that talk about the format, we forgot the rebuttals. Um, <laughs> that's what I was asking. asking right, that's what we're rebuttals, asking you about. And we can do that after the Q&A? Okay. A, a brief? Sure. Okay. So we'll take uh, two more questions and, and then rebuttal. Clark Culley, NNSA. Um, how confident are you that North Korea would never proliferate weapons or weapons technology, given the uh, recent case with, with Syria? And to what uh, extent should we be willing to enforce an embargo or other such uh, punitive measures to prevent a North Korea that decides to proliferate? I, I'd have no confidence that they would not attempt to proliferate. We've seen it. Uh, they proliferated in violation of, of their commitments to uh, pass nuclear reactor technology to Syria. Uh, we saw the U.S. invoke proliferation security initiative, which only applies to WMD or missiles. Uh, in uh, getting India to prevent the overflight uh, in August or September of 2008. Again, a violation of existing UN resolutions. Uh, North Korea had privately told uh, South Korean officials they uh, may proliferate nuclear t uh, technology or fissile material. Uh, and then in the past, North Korean officials have uh, told U.S. officials, you know, they were threatening to, you know, uh, build, test, and proliferate nuclear weapons. So. I think the past action is there, the, uh, and the, the threats or the, the, the pledge to do so has been there. So I think they, they have done it, and they will continue to try to do so. I have very little confidence in any pledge that North Korea makes. Of course, this isn't a unique problem. We've had that problem with Pakistan that was sending plane loads of nuclear materials <coughs> around with the government claiming to have no knowledge as well. I think the question is, do we believe that we can draw red lines and indicate you know, that proliferation, especially to non-state actors, would be a casus belli? I think all the evidence is the North Koreans are doing this primarily for the money. If they see other options to earn money that are not nearly as dangerous or risky, I think that we can probably use that system as well as the threat behind it. But it clearly, you know, this is another reason why you know, North Korea without nuclear weapons is a better place than one with it. But I think to the extent we can stop the growth of the program, we're far better off in trying to stop proliferation as well. This here again, it would be helpful to have China's more effective cooperation in terms of inspections and stopping overflights, et cetera. I've got it right. Um, Stephen Schwartz with the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Writing in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists recently, um, Ted Postel and David Wright made a very strong case that the, by analyzing um, the latest uh, Taipo Dong launches from North Korea, that the technology that they're using for their long-range missiles originated in Russia, and specifically in Russian submarine launch ballistic missiles. And they further argued that that technology is such that it cannot be indigenously manufactured in North Korea, which means that uh, given that the flow apparently has been cut off, that North Korea is limited in how many of these missiles it can build. Um, I guess two-part question, A, are you familiar with that and do you agree with it? And B, if you do agree with it, uh, how does that change our perspective about the threat posed by North Korea, at least vis-a-vis -vis its ability to mount a nuclear warhead uh, on a long-range ballistic missile and use it to threaten us or anybody else? Uh, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the article in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists um, in addition to, to that point, they also mentioned that the, they assessed that the Taepodong 2 launch in, in April was a significant advance over North Korea's previous launches uh, and that the missile would have the capability to reach the continental U.S. with a payload of one ton or more 
uh, if Pyongyang modified it for use as a ballistic missile. Um, as for whether the missile is, you know, from Soviet slash Russian uh, origin or indigenous, uh, you know, I, I don't have enough of a technical background on that, but, uh, you know, I think the consensus from most experts before that uh, was that the uh, North Korean missile was uh, capability was largely indigenous based on expanding from original purchases of Scud missiles. So, you know, they've gone from the Scud to extended range Scuds, there's a whole family of, of Scuds. You know, they extended that to the Nodong. Uh, they've acquired perhaps SSN-6 from, from Russia uh, and, uh, you know, maybe turn that into a Musadon uh, missile, IRBM. Uh, Taepodong, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, what, four Nodong strapped together as a first stage and perhaps this SSN-6 variant as a second stage. So I, I think the general consensus amongst most other experts is that it's largely indigenous, but obviously with sort of a to and from uh, interaction with others. I mean, we know with uh, the flow of, of knowledge and technology was originally from North Korea to Iran, and then Iran, as they built their capability, now they were the ones that were able to successfully launch a satellite, uh, put a satellite in orbit, and North Korea didn't. So I think now there's more of a two-way street. So uh, perhaps difficult to identify the parentage, but I think it's probably more indigenous than perhaps they concluded. But uh, that's just based sort of an amalgamation of, of a lot of other experts' views. I was not aware of uh, that article. <coughs> it doesn't strike me that the number of missiles is terribly relevant in terms of the United States and that the North will never have the capacity to overwhelm the U.S. or to deal with the U.S. without being wiped out in any kind of uh, reply strike. More missiles and more effective and more accurate missiles strikes me as being more important in terms of East Asia, because you're dealing with countries there that are relatively disarmed compared to North Korea as opposed to the United States. And then the more missiles, uh, strikes me there, probably matters very much in terms of the dynamic of other countries. All right, um, closing rebuttals, beginning with Bruce. Um, you know, one thing I'd like both of you to address, if you can, is the areas of agreement and disagreement that you see um, between at least what you've said today um, you know, I guess beyond missile defense, because that's kind of easy. All right. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we inherently agree on the need to maintain the denuclearization policy uh, while first capping and then eliminating um, North Korean missile capabilities and nuclear capabilities. Um, you know, I think perhaps it goes a bit beyond the, the parameters of the debate where it's supposed to be pro and con, I think, you know, inherently we agree on, on the parameters of that. I think perhaps the differences are uh, whether to formally abandon the denuclearization policy uh, or, or not. I, I think we cannot abandon it. I think that uh, sends a dangerous signal not only to North Korea and Iran, but also to our allies. Um, I think there are differences, clear differences between us on uh, I don't think we can or should delink ourselves. Uh, from defending those nations that share our values, uh, such as South Korea uh, and Japan. I think we cannot, uh, you know, leave them to their own uh, defenses. I think we have an obligation, I think, not only to our, our friends and allies, but uh, I think it is inherently in our best interests uh, to defend those who share our values. Um, I, I think I also disagree with the idea that North Korea will never attack the U.S., so therefore it's not a problem for us. I think, you know, the idea is not so much that we fear a single missile will come and, and, and obliterate Los Angeles. It's that the threat is there and that, uh, you know, as a Chinese general apparently said during the Taiwan Straits uh, crisis in the mid-'90s was, you know, will you trade Los Angeles for Taipei? And North Korea may similarly say, We've got nuclear weapons. We are deterred from you attacking us if we act belligerently toward and threatening towards South Korea. Would you really trade Los Angeles for Seoul? Uh, therefore, you know, we can act more provocatively, more threateningly towards Seoul, and you can't do anything about it. So it's, I think, also not only a direct military threat, uh, and we can't discount, uh, you know, a nuclear warhead uh, that can reach the continental U.S., uh, but it's also a co coercion against that limits our ability to defend uh, ourselves as well as our allies. Um, also, I think on, on the approach to China, I would not, uh, you know, ask them to initiate regime change. I think that uh, sets an 
and change a, a, a string of dominoes that we don't know where it could go. Uh, and also, I don't think China would ever do that. Um, I think that's sort of an overall summary. Yeah, I think we definitely agree in terms of what we think the best outcome would be in terms of denuclearization of the peninsula. I think we also clearly agree that China's support and assistance would be very helpful in any effort to try to denuclearize the peninsula. What I'd like to focus on is the, the question of, you know, is it is some, somehow denuclearization holy writ that one can't uh, abandon? You know, Bruce mentioned that, you know, principles and rule of law. I have to say the United States doesn't care one whit about principles in international law. You know, the president goes to Russia and talks about state sovereignty and territorial integrity. The country that has invaded the most countries in the last decade is the United States. One can argue that all of those are justified, but we should not act as if you can attack Serbia, invade Iraq, and then preach to the world about the importance of territorial integrity. We've already violated the nonproliferation principle with our agreement with India. That you know, I think this is a question of we have to make decisions in what's realistic, what's possible. I know what the perfect is and I know what the best would be, but I may have to settle for second best. And I think I might do what the U.S. government has routinely done, which is toss those principles aside and you know, kindly forgotten them when it preaches to Russia, why are you attacking Georgia? Don't you understand you don't do that these days? When Russia could look and say, now, excuse me, wasn't there this country a little bit to the south that you just invaded a couple of years ago? <laughs> so I don't think that's a very good reason. In terms of defending the U.S., there's no doubt it would be better not to have North Korea to have any missiles and any nuclear weapons. But again, I think we live in the world of the possible. Deterrence is very important. Yes, I'd prefer not to have other countries able to deter America, but we've lived in that world for a half century. You know, and that is not going to change. It's likely to expand. Indeed, even in India, there have been discussions about the size of the nuclear arsenal and whether they should have one that can reach intercontinental range, and America comes up not in terms of a, you know, a strike against America, but ensuring that coercion could never be used against them. So we're into a new world where we cannot assume that we can forever act untrammeled and unhindered about the globe. A best option, of course, is not to have that, but this is where I would argue we're far better off with a North Korea with a small arsenal than a North Korea with a growing arsenal and proliferation concerns. Here again, I think we may have to settle for second best. The question of protecting potential allies I would argue that the, the principal responsibility for the United States is defending the United States. It's not at all clear that defending allies is necessary for defending the United States. And indeed, we have to be very wary that alliances can be transmission belts of war as opposed to fire breaks for war. And in this world, especially with the rise of a power like China, we're going to have to make decisions in the future to what extent we are prepared to put American cities on the line to defend allies that are fully capable of defending themselves. Finally, we, you know, preemptively accepting defeat. My reaction is no, we shouldn't preemptively accept defeat, but we also have to live in the world of the possible. We have to recognize what the likely outcome is going to be. We have to be very careful that we don't overreach and make it impossible to achieve a relatively good end that may not be the perfect end. And I'm afraid that's what we risk in this case. Given the current regime in North Korea, given international circumstances, I am skeptical we can get what we want. Then I think we have to be prepared to settle for something second best that I would argue is a major improvement over the current situation, even though not the perfect outcome that I would prefer. Thank you. I would like to thank both of our speakers. And a departure from our last day. We actually have clocks which reflect the fact that they stayed closer to their allotted times than anyone else has in the previous <laughs> oh. debates. Thank you very much for thank participating. You. Thanks to our moderator, thank Jessica Yates. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.